being recorded. All right. Uh, my name is John Dowd. I'm a hydrologist in the uh, Geology Department, University of Georgia, and I'll be moderating today's uh, cyber seminar for Todd Rasmussen, who once again is not here. Uh, I'd like to call your attention to the uh, spring uh, cyber seminar series, which is on your screen. Uh, we have some interesting talks coming up over the next three weeks. The uh, today's speaker is Noah Maloch. He's a research science, scientist at INSTAR, the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research in Boulder, and an assistant professor at Geography at the University of Colorado. He has a specialty in surface water and snow hydrology, remote sensing, and eco-hydrology. He received a PhD from the University of Arizona, and his research interests include processing processes controlling hydrologic fluxes in cold regions uh, with research projects that utilize ground-based systems, remote sensing, and modeling to obtain an understanding of these processes, in particular the distribution of snow and ice. Additional projects look at scaling hydrologic processes in these systems and the fluxes of water, carbon, and nitrogen in montane forests. Today, Noah will be talking about snowmelt as a driver of eco-hydrologic processes, low-hanging fruit for cross-CZO research. And I ask everyone who, uh, if you have a question uh, during the talk, to, you could type it in the box at the lower left-hand portion of your screen, uh, or wait till the end, and, and we'll open it up for general questions, which you could ask uh, via the phone. And with that, I'll turn it over to Noah. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and um, thanks for uh, having me in this uh, seminar series. Uh, what I'd like to do today is kind of a, a two-pronged objective. One is to communicate some recent results that we've obtained with regard to studying eco-hydrological feedbacks in uh, the critical zone observatories of the western United States. And the second is sort of to relay some impressions associated with these comparative studies to help uh, provide some guidance for future cross-CZO uh, research. Um, I do, before jumping in, want to acknowledge the contributions from several colleagues, uh, many from the University of Colorado who are listed here, as well as from the University of California, the University of Arizona, and the University of New Mexico. And so these uh, four institutions have, um, uh, and California being, of course, a, a collaborative of institutions, but have really sort of carried the torch on leading the Western Critical Zone Observatories. Uh, jumping into the, to the next slide, uh, the outline here is to first cover some motivations and guiding questions with regard to studying mountain hydrology, in particular the eco-hydrology of subalpine and montane forests. I'll then step through and talk about some common infrastructure and instrumentation across the Western Critical Zone Observatories and kind of put them into the context of the hydrologic regimes at which they represent. And then in the third component of the seminar, I will show you some of the results where we've been studying feedbacks between vegetation and snowpack in uh, subalpine forests of these critical zone observatories. And then I'll, I'll sort of finalize by discussing some results where we've been studying uh, snowmelt relationships with uh, stream flow. And I think you'll find some of the results to be a bit surprising in terms of some places being decoupled with regard to snowmelt and stream flow. So to sort of set the stage for the motivation, it's important that we uh, recognize the importance of snowmelt runoff for society, uh, not only for the western United States, where about 60 million people depend on snowmelt for their water supply, but when we look globally, about a sixth of the global population, or a billion people, uh, live in places that depend on snowmelt runoff for their water supply. And what this map represents is the ratio of snowfall to runoff globally for the, for the uh, terrestrial land surface. And the areas highlighted in red are those where 
greater than 50% of runoff is derived from snow melt. Um, it's important to note also here that, that most of the developed world is in this region, so one-fourth of the global gross domestic product is produced uh, in these regions that rely on snow melt for their water supply. Uh, when we think about potential perturbations to our understanding of uh, snow melt and our ability to predict snow melt, there are several to consider, the first being related to climate change. So if we look at the western United States and the figure on the left, which has gotten a, a huge amount of attention over the last uh, eight years, shows the 50-year trend in April 1st snow water equivalent, where the open red circles represent decreasing trends in that April 1st snow water equivalent from uh, 15 to 60 percent based on the size of the circle. And the solid blue circles actually represent increasing trends in snow water equivalent over the same 50-year period. And so there's some variability that we see here, then much of that is unexplained, um, but the overall signal is toward a decrease in snow water equivalent associated with uh, regional warming is at least a leading hypothesis. Associated with that regional warming, uh, we've observed earlier snow melt um, over this la over this 50-year period, as well as uh, a shift from snowfall to rainfall. So the graphic on the right shows the percent change from uh, snowfall to rainfall as a proportion of total annual precipitation. The yellow to red areas represent those where we've seen a more dramatic shift toward uh, rainfall in terms of our precipitation type. And the blue areas represent those where we've actually seen a shift from uh, toward more snowfall. So um, again, there's some spatial complexity in the picture here that requires further study, but uh, that does continue to motivate us. So this, this climate perturbation, as I said before, is one of uh, number of perturbations that require us to improve process level knowledge of snowpack processes and the role of snow in the hydrologic cycle. Another perturbation that we can consider that requires increased process level knowledge is associated with vegetation change, whether that vegetation change be associated with the recent mountain pine beetle epidemic across western North America or sort of more gradual changes in forest encroachment uh, where we're seeing forests encroach into what were previously grasslands. So the image on the right, which is of the Flatirons just west of the campus of the University of Colorado, shows over this 100-year period a considerable encroachment of ponderosa pine into what were previously grasslands. So process level knowledge related to snowmelt distribution and its interaction with vegetation is critical if we're to be able to predict the hydrologic response to whatever the vegetation change may be. Another uh, perturbation that we have to consider that's been getting a lot of recent attention are the hydrologic impacts of dust deposition on mountain snow. Uh, land use changes on the Colorado Plateau as well as other portions of the world have led to considerable alterations to aeolian processes and dust transport to mountain environments. This can have a strong radiative forcing on snow melt in the alpine zone and potentially accelerate snow melt rates uh, considerably, resulting in snow disappearance on the order of a month earlier than it otherwise uh, would occur. So again, trying to understand what the uh, hydrologic as well as ecological implications of these different perturbations I mean, there are others that we can throw in the mix as well, but um, as, a, as, a, as a starter, what we need to have is a better process level understanding, and I think that the Critical Zone Observatory Network plays a very important role providing measurements so that we can improve that process level understanding. So perhaps as a sort of unifying science question, and I'm welcome, I welcome people to sort of contradict or augment or edit this science question um, that can unify many of these uh, interests with regard to how perturbations affect the hydrology of mountainous systems is how do changes in climate and land cover influence the partitioning of precipitation and snow melt into the various pathways, these being evapotranspiration, groundwater recharge, change in storage, overland flow. 
uh, many of these remain unknown with regard to uh, the response to these perturbations. Okay, so that sort of sets the stage for uh, what I think are some of the motivating factors with regard to the kind of studies that I would like to do with the Critical Zone Observatory and that I think much of the community is, is interested in, uh, at least from the, from the mountain side. And when it comes to thinking about then the instrumentation that exists in these critical zone observatories and how those can be used, I think it's important for us to recognize that there are some considerable differences in the instrumentation that exists at these different critical zone observatories. And at the same time, there are some similarities. And so I think what we as a community need to do is make the most out of the similarities that exist within this, in the critical zone observatories and evaluate where each critical zone observatory could be augmented to um, facilitate more cross-CZO research. And so looking at the critical zone observatory network, uh, the six networks, or uh, six uh, sites are shown here, and the three that I'm going to sort of focus on for you today, if I can get this little pointer to get going here, is the Southern Sierra Critical Zone Observatory, the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory, and the Jemez River Basin Critical Zone Observatory, which is a partnered or uh, sort of a two-pronged CZO with the Santa Catalina Mountains but I will only be discussing data from the Hemez River Basin Critical Zone Observatory. Now, now, I should mention that I'm only going to be discussing a subset of the data that's collected at these critical zone sites. It would be um, time prohibitive to discuss all the similarities and all the differences that exist at these different CZOs, but what I'd like to do is give you an impression of where there are some overlaps that we've been able to use towards some science inquiry. Uh, first of all, we've had the benefit of deploying what I call eco-hydrological instrument clusters at all three of these critical zone observatories. Um, and actually, in, in the case of the New Mexico CZO and the Colorado CZO, we had actually set up these instrument clusters before the CZO program uh, initiated. Um, so these instrument clusters consist of co-located observations of snow depth, so the snow depth sensors are indicated here, soil moisture and temperature directly beneath these, uh, sap flow, carbon dioxide and water vapor fluxes, as well as a suite of meteorological variables from a flux tower, which is sort of the anchor point of the uh, instrument cluster. Now, when it comes to these instrument clusters, we've set up the instruments on the ground in a stratified pattern so that they sample the environment in under canopy positions, canopy edge positions, and open canopy positions. And that was really inspired by, in fact, about 15 years ago, Paul Brooks and I dug a trench away from a tree bowl within the snowpack and just discovered this dramatic variability um, controlled by the canopy structure with regard to the snowpack properties. And then if you go hiking throughout the high country um, in the springtime, you see a spatial mosaic of snow uh, on the ground and bare ground patches that are dictated largely by canopy structure. So this stratified pattern was really set up based on a desire to quantify the dynamics associated with what are commonly known as tree wells, where you have lower snow accumulation under the canopy and deeper snow within the clearings. And it's important to kind of envision and it's hard to do hand-waving when you're on a cyber seminar, but it's important for us to envision um, an environment in this graphic where perhaps trees are getting denser or less dense, and so the percentage of the area that's clearing or under canopy is changing through time. Um, and how will the hydrology respond to those changes requires that we have kind of a first-order under, first understanding of the controls of the vegetation on not only the snowpack dynamics, but also the soil moisture and soil temperature response and the vegetation response via the sap flow, as well as sort of the footprint response as obtained from the flux tower. So speaking of these flux towers, uh, that is a common theme amongst the three western critical zone observatories. There's one flux tower at the Boulder Creek. 
uh, Critical Zone Observatory, which is managed by the Now Outridge Long-Term Ecological Research Program. It used to be managed by Russ Monson and the Ameriflux Program. Therefore, it has a fairly long record relative to the other Critical Zone Observatories. In fact, it has one of the longest records of subalpine forest fluxes in snow-dominated systems in the world. Uh, there is one flux tower at the Southern Sierra Critical Zone Observatory, um, but three others sort of straddle the Southern Sierra CZO flux tower um, to lower elevations and one at higher elevation above the one that's actually within the CZO. And um, depending on which tower you look at, uh, you got about a three-year record from this particular flux tower. Um, and then at the Hemez River Basin Critical Zone Observatory, um, there are three flux towers, two of which I'm most familiar with. Uh, one is in a Ponderosa pine stand and one in a mixed conifer forest. Um, and these have anywhere on the order of a three to four year record, depending on the tower that you, that you seek to get data from. So that's sort of, at least for this talk, the, the common instrumentation that I'm going to talk about. Um, I should have included a slide on stream flow. There are stream flow measurements that I will uh, leverage in this talk as well. There are other common um, instrumentation amongst these critical zone observatories, such as piezometers um, and other things associated with monitoring uh, water table heights. But um, I'm not going to touch on those further today, and I encourage you to follow up with the PIs of, of the different CZOs if you have interest in some of those other measurements. Uh, first, just to give you a general sense of the lay of the land with these different critical zone observatories, the Jemez River Basin Critical Zone Observatory is located in the Valles Caldera Environmental Observatory. There uh, you can see two of the flux towers, um, one, the lower one on the bottom left. Uh, get the pointer back here. I'm realizing I'm using my mouse and none of you guys can see that. Uh, that would be the, the lower elevation flux tower that's in the Ponderosa Pine Forest. This would be the mixed conifer uh, flux tower site that I'll be showing you some data from. There are also MET stations which have been distributed across the area and um, some uh, stream flow gauges. I don't have time to cover the zero order basins which are instrumented in this site. and. Um, I apologize to any of the PIs of the CZOs if I misrepresent the instrumentation that's here. The, the sites are constantly evolving, so there's a lot more instrumentation than what I'm going to be showing you here, and so I just want to state that as a, as a disclaimer on this. Uh, the Southern Sierra Critical Zone Observatory uh, is a site that's located in the Kings River Experimental Forest. Uh, you can see the general location located here, and its position is, is located to try to capture dynamics associated with the uh, rain-snow transition elevation. That's seen as being a sort of critical tipping point with regard to the hydrology of the Sierra Nevada. And so Roger Bales and his colleagues have designed this critical zone observatory to explore questions associated with tipping points in terms of precipitation type between rain and snowfall. Uh, you can see kind of a more detailed uh, zoom in on the instrumentation uh, for three of the catchments, uh, or actually four of the catchments here on the right. The small pink uh, hex marks represent these instrument cluster nodes, uh, similar to the layout that I showed you in, in a previous slide. The uh, flux tower is located right here, and as I said before, there are two flux towers off to the left at lower elevation and another flux tower up at a higher elevation um, that you don't see in this graphic. Uh, you also see the location of MET stations as well as uh, stream gauges at several locations at the outflow of these, um, of these subcatchments. Uh, now moving to the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory and just kind of it's nice to maybe take more of an uh, oblique view of the landscape in an environment like this where you're on the edge of the Great Plains. And you can see that we've deployed these instrument clusters to look at the uh, snow vegetation interactions in a foothills environment at uh, 1,900 meters above sea level, where about 59% of annual precipitation comes in the form of snow. Uh, we've deployed these also at 2,600 meters in a montane environment where about 70% of annual precipitation comes in the form of snow. Uh, 
and then at the subalpine zone, which is where Flux Tower is, about 3,100 meters above sea level, and about 85% of precipitation comes in the form of snow. And similarly at our alpine site of 3,600 meters above sea level, about 85% precipitation comes in the form of snow. So there really is a pretty large volume of data coming in from all of these instrument clusters on an anywhere from 10 minute to hourly basis, depending on the site. Um, and so between all these different uh, critical zone observatories, you can see inherently that elevation is a common theme, that instrumentation is set up across a variety of elevational environments. Um, and associated with that differences in climate and differences in the ecology in each of these systems. So I think it's important for us to, you know, if we step back and look at these three sites, which are shown by these large uh, red stars on the map here, and actually I think they may have gotten moved off of their proper location, but they're approximately in the right spot. Um, if we were to sit back and wipe the map off of the critical zone observatory network, which I'm not suggesting we do, but if we sat down with a piece of paper and said, let's draw out um, six sites to study the critical zone in the United States, we might take a more um, systematic view as to where and when we should be um, instrumenting things. And so given that we're in this situation where, of course, we at, at NSF, they award uh, based on merit of proposals, we have somewhat of an ad hoc network that's put together. So it's important, I think, for us to recognize that. And then to say, of this ad hoc network, uh, what are the regimes that are represented within this network? And so with regard to the Western US and the CZOs there, I asked, what are the hydrologic regimes that are represented by these CZOs? How would we go about evaluating that? I've spent a lot of time in the field at all three of these places. And I have an intuition in my mind about the differences in the regimes that exist here. But quantitatively, how would I um, articulate that? And so I think it's important that we go about doing that. So um, I'll just step back for a moment and note all these yellow uh, dots on this map represent the operational snow stations in the western United States. Um, the green dots and red dots are, are those that are managed by the uh, California Cooperative Snow Survey, and the yellow dots are managed by the United States Natural Resource Conservation Service. Now, at each of these dots, there's a snow pillow that's been monitoring daily or even hourly snow water equivalent for upwards of 30 years. And so there's a lot of data here that can be mined to sort of characterize what the hydrologic regimes are in this region and then determine you know, which of these regimes are represented by the critical zone observatory network. Um, and I would say we got lucky because there are different regimes here. So let me give you a sense of how we're going about thinking about these different regimes. Let's say we take one of those snow pillow measurements from uh, the summer period, which is snow free, into the fall period where we begin accumulating snow and we have some magnitude of peak snow water equivalent. We we can identify a time period, which is snow-free. We can identify an accumulation period, which is our time to peak snow water equivalent. We can identify a time of melt, which is the time from the peak to when the snow disappears. And if we divide this peak snow water equivalent by the time of melt, we can identify an ablation slope, which kind of gives us a rough metric of the snow melt rate. And so when we think about this sort of the, the different metrics which are represented here, perhaps we could compare them across the region to identify consistencies at the regional scale that identify hydrologic regimes, at least from the standpoint of the snow hydrology. We could certainly do this with other hydrologic variables. Um, so let's do that. So here, looking at the southern Rockies, I'm plotting on the vertical scale the time to peak uh, snow water equivalent, which is basically that accumulation period. And on the horizontal axis, we have the magnitude of that peak snow water equivalent. The black dots, which you can see best in this bottom graphic here, represent all the station years from all 800 plus stations across the western United States. And then in each plot, we see the different regions highlighted in blue. So the southern Rockies are shown as the blue data points here. Sierra Nevada is here, and the Arizona-New Mexico region is shown here. 
And what you can see is these regions do kind of break into different regimes where the Rockies are skewed toward longer duration of snow accumulation season. So we see most of the data points push toward the upper bound of the black dots. And the peak snow water equivalent is actually at an upper to moderate scale. So we're sort of our data points are pushed off um, slightly to the right. If we look at the Sierra Nevada, we see a dramatic difference in terms of that length of the accumulation season, where basically none of the data points, with the exception of maybe a couple outliers, sort of fall in this upper bound with regard to the length of the accumulation season. That really is distinctive of the continental environment. Um, but because of our proximity to moisture source, we do see the maritime influence of the snowpack and therefore relatively large range in terms of the magnitude of the peak snow water equivalent. Now where we see some very stark differences is when we look in the Arizona, New Mexico region where in general the length of the accumulation season is quite low, so we're in the lower left of the, of the screen here, and the magnitude of the peak snow water equivalent is also quite low. So we see some fairly general uh, breakouts in terms of the hydrologic regimes that these different sites represent. Um, that really is a, a, vet, a viewpoint with regard to the accumulation season. We can do the same thing with regard to the ablation season. And so here we're plotting that ablation slope, which is basically an index of the melt rate um, from a rough sense, but not uh, exclusively. Uh, uh, and we see that ablation slope related here to the day of water year of peak snow water equivalent, which is the timing of when the snow melt occurs, or the timing of that peak snow water equivalent when we shift from the accumulation season to the melt season. And again, you see a breakout where the timing of that peak snow water equivalent in the southern Rocky region tends to be shifted off to the right of the data distribution. The Sierra Nevada, uh, given warmer conditions, has a relatively earlier onset of spring, and therefore we see the data points shifted more off to the left. And with regard to the ablation slope, we see that in general the Sierra Nevada is pushed toward the upper end of the data distribution, implying that it has a faster melt rate than the Rockies, where we see those data points pushed more toward the bottom of the distribution. And as we look at the Arizona, New Mexico region, the points are exclusively pushed toward the left side of the plots, indicating that the onset of spring occurs significantly earlier, or the onset of that snowmelt season is occurring um, significantly earlier with the ablation slopes actually spread across um, this data distribution fairly evenly, not much to uh, report with regard to that. So thinking then about these differences in the hydrologic regimes, it's important for us to keep that on the back of our mind when we start exploring the processes from the different uh, CZO measurements and ask ourselves, what are the end members that are being represented by these measurements? Are there tipping points between these end members? Can we trade time for space between these different CZOs based on um, their hydrologic regime? For example, does uh, New Mexico snowpack reflect what a Colorado snowpack will look like in 50 years? Um, these are the kinds of questions that we can ask ourselves if we carefully identify the regimes and carefully identify the continuum that connects them. Um, so I'd now like to jump in and start talking about some of the results that we've obtained from these different measurements. Um, and here's the snow trench that Paul Brooks and I dug um, some 15 years ago that sort of tipped off this whole idea about setting up these ultrasonic depth sensors in under canopy, canopy edge, and open environments. Anyone that's spent any time skiing in the mountains is keenly aware of the processes associated with tree wells. So I don't um, claim that this is anything particularly novel in concept, but putting into practice, I think, has been really helpful. So in this image, you can sort of see the snow depth decreasing from the left to the right. And if you look closely, depending on the fidelity of your of your monitor, you can actually see differences in the snow microstructure um, 
and differences in the thickness of the layers of the snowpack as you move away from the tree. In fact, you can see a horizon right here in the snowpack, and you can see this layer of new snow getting thicker and thicker as you move away from the tree bowl. And so the memory of this is, is all retained within the snowpack. So if you identified layer thicknesses throughout this profile, you would see them change in thickness as you move from the tree bowl out into the clearing. And this layering is really what controls the transformation of, of energy and mass within the snowpack and the fluxes of vapor through the snowpack. So given that, it's important that we really understand the details of it. So when we look at this general picture and the details of the snow microstructure, it's important to remember that the vegetation is exerting a control on the snowpack. As the snow melts, it's exerting a first order control on the root zone moisture content, and therefore it's affecting water use by the plants. And that's what we sort of want to articulate in this section of the seminar is this feedback cycle. So how does the vegetation influence the snow distribution? How does the timing and magnitude of snow melt uh, influence soil moisture? And how does the vegetation respond to that water availability from the snow melt? So uh, to start off looking at the different critical zone observatories and some of the instrument cluster measurements that we've made, uh, here we're looking at the magnitude of snow depth uh, at, at peak accumulation on the vertical scale in under canopy environments shown in green, uh, canopy edge environments shown in turquoise, and open environments shown in blue. And the top plot is for the Colorado CZO, the middle plot is for the Sierra Nevada CZO, and the bottom plot is for the New Mexico CZO. And what you see is a consistent message in Colorado and California. There's considerably more snow accumulation in the open environments than there is in the under canopy environments. You can see that at the California site at both low um, elevation and at high elevation. But where this really starts to get interesting is when you look at the New Mexico site. Um, at the New Mexico site, you have a kind of a mixed bag where the differences are actually pretty subtle in terms of snow accumulation in the under canopy environment and the open. And so the differences in the accumulation of snow exhibit this control associated with vegetation differently depending on the climatic regime as well as the vegetation structure. And we haven't yet fully teased out uh, which of those two controlling factors is most important. Uh, but it remains an open question for further study. So there are those differences in the accumulation of snow, but what about the disappearance timing of snow? And that's associated with the differences in the melt rate in the open and the under canopy environments. If you look at um, here, oh, I think these got flipped over. The California site is actually shown at the top. I apologize, so the arrows are, are a bit askew. Uh, but at the California site, you see in general that the snow disappears later in the open environment than it does in the under canopy environment. And at the Colorado site, you also see the snow disappearing later in the open environment than you do in the under canopy environment. So perhaps for those of you who have spent any time hiking in the high country in May, you're familiar with this, that um, if you want to, if you didn't bring your Sorel boots and you're hiking in your, your summer hiking boots, you might want to to um, hike through uh, on the south sides of trees where there's going to be less snow um, under the canopy than there will be out in the open. So you can avoid the snow by kind of being near the canopy. Um, here we're showing that indeed that snow does persist later in the open environments than it does in the under canopy environments. Now again, where this really gets interesting is when you contrast that with the New Mexico site. We actually see during several of these years we've studied, the snow persists later under the canopy than it does in the open environment. And one of the first things we might want to start to think about with these differences are the roots that are within the soil underneath the snowpack and how they're activating with regard to drawing water out of the system and how the vegetation is responding to the differences and the spatial mosaic at which water enters the system. Um, it, I should mention that when we think about you know when this snow disappears. That's really Mother Nature's drip irrigation system turning off. 
So this really does mark the beginning of the dry down period in these uh, Mediterranean climates where their, the system is basically going to hang out and wait for monsoon rainfall, if we're talking about New Mexico or Colorado, um, to rewet the soil, whereas in the Sierra there's very little summer rain. So in fact, we may be dealing with the total water input from the system and entering dry down for the remainder of the year once the snow disappears. Um, so upon this evolution of the snow accumulation to when the snow disappears, there's transformations in terms of the microstructure of the snowpack. Now to study that, we've been digging trenches from tree bowl to tree bowl, and I want to kind of show you some of these. In this graphic here, you can see a trench dug across. The image doesn't quite go far enough to the left. There's basically another tree bowl, uh, maybe half a meter off the screen to the left. You can just see the edge of the canopy. Um, here. So we've been digging these trenches and characterizing snow microstructure from tree bowl to tree bowl using a number of different techniques, including near infrared photography um, and contact spectroscopy. And the contact spectroscopy, which is illustrated here, uses um, a hyperspectral radiometer to measure the reflectance of light off of the snow from an artificial light source, which you can see the, the illuminated target right there. And by characterizing the absorption features associated with ice um, in the sample, we can determine the snow grain size. This allows us to map the distribution of grain size from tree bowl to tree bowl. And we collected uh, samples within each of the squares of this construction fence so that we could then spline interpolate it and build this image of the grain size from tree bowl. So there'd be a tree bowl here on the left of this plot a tree bowl here on the right, and there's 360 centimeters across the clearing. And you can see very different sort of snow microstructure in the center of the clearing um, versus the under canopy environment. So this is part of the story with regard to the evolution of the snowpack and how it's different in open versus under canopy environments. And that becomes increasingly important as we move later into the melt season. So this image at the top is for uh, toward the end of uh, March in 2006, and this is around the middle of April in 2006. And what you can see is that the tree that's the uh, snow that's to the south of this tree, which would be here, is getting much more solar radiation, and therefore it's much more metamorphosed than the snow that's in the shade of the south tree. So we can sort of picture the sun maybe up over here above the picture of me on the, on the top left, and these trees are providing shade so that this area is in the sun and this area is in the shade. And what you see is basically the preservation of a winter snowpack in the shade of the tree and a spring snowpack um, in the area that's got direct illumination from the sun, as well as enhanced thermal radiation from the tree that's heating up in the sun. Okay, so we see these pretty dramatic differences. Now, it's important for us to characterize sort of the role of the vegetation structure with regard to those radiative fluxes. And so to do that, a PhD student that's been working with me and who's about to finish, Keith Musselman, has been using hemispherical photography positioned directly underneath the ultrasonic snow depth sensors from our instrument clusters. And with these with these hemispherical photos, using a Beer's Law approximation, he's able to estimate the daily and hourly direct beam canopy transmissivity throughout the entire snow season. So you can see here from the winter solstice at the bottom of this graphic to the summer solstice at the top of the graphic, the direct beam canopy transmissivity ranging from 0 to 1. Um, with one being in white, so you can sort of see, it's almost a distortion of the image that you see on the left, where you can see sort of the clearing stretched out here, and therefore high uh, direct beam transmissivity versus canopy elements that give relatively low direct beam transmissivity. And so as the track of the sun for each day passes through um, these different gaps within the canopy, we can characterize the change throughout the day of the direct beam transmissivity. We can relate and use these.
direct beam transmissivity measures to estimate the direct beam irradiance on the snow surface. And just remember that we do have a snow depth sensor that's actually looking at the snow where these air, uh, estimates are derived for. So it really allows us something that can be used to explain the measurements that are being made at the critical zone observatory. And here you can see kind of that evolution, again, from the winter solstice to the summer solstice of the direct beam transmissivity across time for each day um, as we go from the bottom of the panel to the top. And you can see that sort of proportion of direct beam versus diffuse uh, plotted um, on the color scale here, as well as the average daily uh, transmissivity. So we're able to get some fairly robust measures of the direct beam irradiance with this, and we've verified these with irradiance measurements in the field. But importantly, we've used these estimates of the direct beam transmissivity and the direct beam irradiance to relate that to the changes in the snow cover that we see. So on the vertical scale here is the change in snow water equivalent, or the delta sweet. This is analogous to the ablation slope, so we can think of this as how fast um, is the snow melting. And so as we go from the top of the panel to the bottom, we're getting a higher and higher snow melt rate. And on the horizontal axis is the cumulative direct beam solar radiation from March 23rd, which was the date at which uh, the snow pit was dug to get the density measurement until the date of snow disappearance. And what you can see when you plot these up and fit a line to it that you explain about 58% um, of the variability, at least for the sample year in 2008, um, in, of the variability in the um, change in snow water equivalent or that ablation slope is explained by that cumulative direct beam solar radiation. Uh, we see lower explanatory capabilities in 2009 and 2010. Uh, we're exploring the reasons for that, and we've actually made some improvements that are um, not reflected in this graphic. Um, but nevertheless, the p-values are still um, statistically significant for the 2010 analysis. Um, but we think that these differences are related to cloud cover. Um, as uh, I should mention also that we have now coupled these direct beam solar radiation estimates to a detailed snowpack energy balance model called snowpack. And these do show that you can improve the model's uh, ability to simulate the snow cover by including this measure of the direct beam transmissivity. So now that we've kind of considered the dynamics of what controls uh, the snow accumulation with regard to the vegetation and the timing of snow melt. It's important to remember that when that snow disappears, that marks the beginning of the, of the soil dry down. And just so that you don't have to take my word for that, let's kind of look at some example plots. And this is from uh, Niwot Ridge in Colorado, where we see snow accumulation in under canopy environments in green, open environments in red, and we hit our peak, and then we get down to when the snow disappears. And right around that timing of when the snow disappears is when we hit peak soil moisture for the, snow, for the soil moisture sensors that are directly underneath these depth sensors. So when we look at this, we see that the melt rate is increasing as we move later and later into the season. We are approaching closer and closer towards saturation or perhaps exceeding saturation and draining above our field capacity into the, uh, out of the rooting zone. But in any case, what we see is that that peak soil moisture is occurring right about when that snow disappears. So this state of snow disappearance really does kind of have an ecological importance that needs to be given further consideration. When we do the same thing as those plots, which I just showed you, for all the different CCO sites um, in uh, New Mexico, Colorado, and California, we see that the relationship between the day of year of snow disappearance on the horizontal scale and the day of year of maximum or peak soil moisture on the vertical scale, they fall pretty close to this one-to-one -one line, indicating that that time of snow disappearance, whether we're in any of these different hydrologic regimes, coincides strongly with the timing of maximum soil moisture. We can discuss if people have questions about the reasons for that and the implications of that. So, one thing we might want to then step into and, and, and discuss is how do these relatively small-scale varying patterns of snowmelt and snow disappearance 
How do they influence vegetation with regard to how they access water from the system? And I really like the experiment that uh, Jan Hopmans and Peter Hartzell have developed in the southern Sierra CZO, where they've instrumented uh, now two trees, originally started with one tree, with a sort of a bicycle wheel with spokes, where along each spoke are uh, vertical profiles of soil moisture sensors, as well as, I believe, matrix potential and soil temperature that really allow them to look at, as the snow ablates in a you know, variable pattern around the tree, how the water fluxes change within the system, including how the, the trees are accessing the water. Um, they've labeled this the, the oh, I've, I've, the little typo here, this should be CZ tree, not CV tree. This is their uh, CZ tree experiment, and they're monitoring the horizontal and vertical variability in the soil moisture and temperature around, as well as matrix potential around these trees. And so I think it's a, a, a real step forward and something that perhaps the other critical zone observatories should consider adopting. I can discuss that a little bit later. Um, to add value to those measurements, they've taken a sister tree adjacent to their CZ trees and basically sandblasted away the soil um, to expose uh, the distribution of roots. Um, and then they've actually used a, um, a three-dimensional laser mapping technique to put this into a quantifiable space within a computerized domain so that they can represent this three-dimensional structure of the rooting zone and the root distribution um, for facilitating the models that they're using. So now that we've sort of characterized, okay, we're putting water into the system via the snowpack in a pattern that is dictated in part by vegetation structure. Once that water enters the system, of course, vegetation is responding. And so what are the, what's the influence of this snow melt on vegetation response during the growing season? And that's so we're, we're transitioning a little bit to discuss this here. Um, this is actually a map of the entire Sierra Nevada, and you can see uh, two different water years are displayed here, water year 1990 and water year 1998. The black circles represent the magnitude of snow water equivalent um, on April 1st, or, um, or actually this would be the peak snow water equivalent uh, for these years for these different stations. And you can see that in 1990, it was a relatively low snow year relative to 1998, where the size of the circles are much larger, indicating a much deeper snowpack accumulated that year. And the colors behind it represent the peak normalized difference vegetation index, or the greenness of the landscape um, during the growing season following the snowmelt period. And you can see that in general, much drier, much browner is represented here um, in 1990 versus 1998, where we have a much greener uh, forest and landscape associated with the greater water input. Now, if we do this for the entire, uh, I should mention this uh, greenness metric is derived from uh, ADHRR data, um, so it has some caveats associated with it. Um, but because it's with ADHRR, we have a very long time series that we can look at. And so here, looking from 1982 to the year 2006, the red line represents the mean peak vegetation greenness uh, for each year as we go throughout the time series. And the, the box plots here represent the magnitude of the peak snow water equivalent, where the black dot represents the mean snow water equivalent. The boxes represent the standard deviation above and below, and the vertical bars represent the range and the snow water equivalent across the domain for in terms of the peak each year. And what you can see is that as the snow water equivalent goes up and goes down, as it goes up and as it goes down, there's a response with regard to the peak normalized difference vegetation index, indicating that there is some memory in the system with regard to the snow melt and the vegetation response during the growing season. So we can get a better statistical handle on this by sort of plotting that peak normalized difference vegetation index on the vertical scale here um, versus that peak snow water equivalent on the horizontal scale here. And when we do it for the entire data set, we get our squared values on the order of uh, 0.5. Um, when we do this for specific elevation zones, which we've done here, so at 1725 meter elevation, 
1975 meters elevation and 2975 meter elevation. Three different elevation bands around the entire Sierra show uh, relatively strong correlations between NDVI and snow water equivalent at the middle and lower elevation, but with weaker correlations as we move to the higher elevation. And as we look at a plot of this across all elevation zones in terms of the R squared that would be represented by each of these lines, we see that there's a relatively high R squared in this sort of mid-elevation zone. And then the system becomes less dependent uh, with regard to the greenness. It becomes less dependent on the amount of snow accumulation each year. And what we think is that this represents a shift or a threshold elevation where the system shifts from water limitation to energy limitation. Now, this regional scale analysis is something that really needs in situ measurements to support the findings. And so we've adopted some of the Southern Sierra Critical Zone Observatory data to support this regional analysis. And that's shown here, where we've got snow water equivalent on the vertical scale and date on the horizontal scale. And we see that the blue line, which represents the snow water equivalent, we've got three very different years with regard to snow water equivalent at this middle elevation site. And we see that the gross ecosystem exchange is increasing as we get more and more snowpack each year. And again, and this is in that sort of water limitation zone as we found in the NDVI analysis um, from the previous slide. <laughs> now when we look at our higher elevation flux tower, we see, again, uh, from the two years of data that we have, uh, peak snow water equivalent is quite a bit higher um, in 2011 than it was in 2010. Um, but the gross ecosystem exchange actually shows a decrease. So again, it indicates this decoupling between the snow water equivalent and the greenness of the forest, supporting the argument that we're shifting from a water limited limited system here versus an energy limited system here. And related to that is the fact that you can see from the higher elevation station that gross ecosystem exchange really kind of falls off completely in the winter, indicating that there is a distinct growing season, whereas at the lower elevation or mid-elevation station, the GEE remains elevated all winter long, indicating that there really is no end to the growing season. Um, I'm going to be running out of time, so I'm going to have to skip the third topic, which I was going to discuss for you today. Um, and I'd like to sort of wrap up and, and give you a sense of some of my concluding thoughts on this. Um, the, the results that I've given you sort of give you some examples of some of what I think are exciting things that we can do in the critical zone observatories with regard to eco-hydrological feedbacks. But really, I think we should think of this as just an example of how can we generate other uh, cross CZO activities. I mean, I was just happened to be doing research in these three places before the CZO program began. So it was low hanging, so I termed it low hanging fruit because it was for me. But we want this to be a community resource. How do we get other groups to get involved? Many of these groups may be interested in doing cross CZO research. It might actually be easier for them to get their foot in the door with cross CZO research. Um, as it may not sort of step on the toes of existing uh, investigators within the CZOs. And so I think it's important for us to think about this as a network and as cross-CZO research and think about how can we um, expand the scope of cross-CZO research. I think one important way we need to think about this is that each of the hydrologic states represented in this instrument cluster and that might be measured by other CZOs has analogs with regard to um, satellite measurements. And so, so we might want to think about expanding the framework for the CZO to include satellite data and leverage partnerships with, with NASA. Um, my final parting thoughts on this are that, uh, in general, the Western CZOs provide infrastructure to improve process level understanding of the eco-hydrological feedbacks across elevational gradients. But we need to step back and say, as a network, you know, what are the hydrologic regimes that the network represents? I mean, I think that's a first order thing to start with in terms of doing any cross-CZO research. Uh, in addition to that, addressing broader questions across CZOs is going to require common infrastructure. So in some cases, uh, one CZO may have a really good way of measuring soil moisture, or the, the CZ tree is a great example of this. 
Um, how can we adopt that in other critical zone observatories, given that there are different science objectives within the different CZOs? And then finally, when it comes to the integrated measurements, I really think we need to start thinking across spatial scales. Um, that way we can explore tipping points with regard to the feedbacks uh, which govern fluxes of water, energy, and carbon across the landscape. Um, I have a number of funding sources that I need to acknowledge here, including the CZO program, uh, NSF's Hydrologic Sciences program, um, and two programs at NASA, the Terrestrial Hydrology program, um, and the JPL Office of the Chief Scientist. With that, I can take questions. Uh, thank you, Noah. That was a, a very interesting talk. And uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, they could either type them into the box at the bottom or uh, just call out or raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you, I guess. All right, well, I'll ask a question. You know, as somebody who, uh, who works in an area that the long-term annual average snowfall is uh, like one inch a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what kind of problems do you have uh, with your instrumentation in the you know the cold and the and the you know deep snow? Um, that's a good question. Um, there are so many different challenges that we face. It's hard to pinpoint one. And, uh, wind is a is a places with blowing snow. I think are the most challenging to work in. Um, places that have um, dramatic uh, blowing snow, in particular the, our alpine site here in Colorado, even the most simplistic problems become very difficult to deal with because um, you can't really open up any electronics effectively. Um, you can't really work without your gloves on. Um, it really presents a lot of problems. Um, other things relate to power. I mean, we're working largely in places without line power, um, but I haven't really seen any cold-related issues with regard to our power supplies other than the fact that, you know, batteries don't hold the charge as well in cold environments. Um, so, you know, it's a challenging place. There are, these are remote places to maintain field work. I, my hat is off to all the field techs that keep all this stuff going, and they're constantly helping me out. Um, on keeping my instrumentation going. Right. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, this is Ian Van Reinsauter from Rutgers University. I was wondering, uh, with regard to your proposed transition between energy and water limited uh, yes. the, uh, along the elevation, uh, is it possible that um, at a high elevation, the snow doesn't stay at high elevation, but Laterally, I uh, get transported into lower elevation. So actually, the uh, the high snow in the high elevation is the benefit in the lower elevation vegetation. Uh, is that possible? Um, I'm sorry. What do you mean by the snow doesn't stay in the high elevation? I think we do have a meeting. Oh, uh, we know that one thing we know is that water flows from high to low. Yeah, we're doing I mean, you have a lot. Oh, so you mean the snow melt? Right. So. Do you mean riparian vegetation is going to be sustained by snowmelt from higher elevations? Right, it wouldn't higher foothills, you know, and when you have, you have more recharge into the alluvial aquifers, you have more river flow, so that uh, that will transfer from uh, high to low water, um, elevations, you know, the water moves uh, from high to low. Right. That might have actually uh, removed some of the water benefits, but the benefit from no. the high elevation to the lower elevation. Right, so the, I mean that's a great point, and so you know if we're explaining 50% of the variability in greenness from the snowpack, um, part of the unexplained variance may be due to uh, lateral transfer of water within the system, and so it only makes sense that the um, that transpiration rates and photosynthesis of of vegetation at the toe of slopes would be sustained by snowmelt and lateral flow from water at higher elevations. Um, we haven't looked into that yet, but um, I believe Christina Tag at UCSB has started to explore some of those dynamics with her model, um, but it's certainly something that needs more attention. Thank you. Uh, Gordon Grant has a question, has his hand up. Uh, do I click on him or do you click on him? Uh, I'm not sure. I think he just needs to open his phone. Uh, Gordon, are you muted? 
I don't think he's muted. All right. Well, does somebody else have a question? Sorry. Oh, I'll ask another question then. Uh, given the, you know, your results that you found so far suggest that that uh, there's some real opportunity to go back to sort of what what people did uh, earlier with trying to manage the snowpack with uh, snow fences and vegetation, et cetera. Uh, have you thought about any of that? Yeah, so um, like snow manipulation studies, mm -hmm. I've, I've thought quite a bit about that. I mean, it, it, the, a snow fence doesn't work that well in the forest, for one, um, because there's not a lot of, you know, a snow fence relies on, on wind to do the work for it. And typically, in the, depending on the forest density, you may not have the wind speed necessary to create a redistribution associated with the fence. I've actually given some thought to using um, uh, Eric Small had done, and actually this is done by several groups, um, doing some some roof experiments or some drought plots where you basically uh, put roofs over the landscape to prevent uh, rainfall from hitting the land surface. And, um, so you deploy the roof during rain and then and then remove it after. And that's difficult with snow, but I'd like to see something eventually developed there where maybe we use a, some type of a conveyor system or maybe graduate students with shovels, but that's um, pretty uh, torturous. Um, but I would like to see us move toward some snow manipulation experiments. I'm just not exactly sure in the forest how we go about doing that because it's a difficult problem, and snow microstructure is so fragile. You can't just... You can't just shovel snow and pile it into another location and call it a natural snowpack. You've completely altered the microstructure of the snow when you um, when you begin you know, digging it and, and moving it. So it's not as simple as rainfall plots um, and rain simulations. Right, uh, but if memory serves, there there was research done on, on small patch uh, clear cuts, et cetera, to try to manipulate. Uh, well, right. So, yeah. So, the Fraser Experimental Forest, and you know, the Forest Service, is, of course, has in part led the way on this. And there's lots of um, forest manipulation plots that could be used to potentially explore this. If you can identify some that have equivalent climatologies, that's critical, right? If they have differences in meteorology, it could be difficult to pinpoint the sources of the differences. But I believe the Southern CZO has some sites that might be uh, good potentials for that. Right. Uh, is there any other questions? Anybody? Uh, I, can you hear oh, me now? Oh, I, okay, Gordon, is that you? Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know that my phone got to respond. Uh, fabulous talk. No, really, really interesting stuff. So my question is, how are you thinking about the uh, scaling up problem? In other words, from the plot or trench measurements, You've got some wonderful views of how the microstructure is changing and so forth. How do you translate that through some thinking about architecture and, and topography? I mean, how do you go the next step to talk about melt dynamics at a landscape scale? So, yeah, that's a great question. So I think there's probably two directions that one could take with it. One is to preserve the microscale variability at that landscape scale. And to do that, you would need LIDAR data, and we have it. And we're actually, that's a, I just didn't have time to discuss it, but that's a future direction we're imminently moving on, is to be able to do all this detailed uh, microscale analyses at the landscape scale using LIDAR data. It's not going to get us to the regional scale. Um, and then I think the second approach is developing ways that we can parameterize the sub uh, the small scale variability at the model scale. Um, and that's a difficult problem that needs a lot of attention. And we've given a lot of thought to it. And it's something that, um, you know, probably is going to have to be done through some type of an optimization scheme. I don't really see any, any other way around it. That's a little bit unsatisfying for me because I'm interested in maintaining the, the small scale process level knowledge. But if we go out to, you know, say, 500 to 1,000 square kilometers, we're probably going to have to be um, thinking about how we can represent some of this small-scale variability um, with, with uh, you know, subgrid parameterizations. Did you have some, some other thoughts on it, Gordon? <laughs> I wish. No, I, I think the LIDAR is, is certainly one way to really capture the pattern at a broader scale. Uh, but
but but you know you're the, the other thing is maybe there are some distinctive architectural elements you know uh, sort of higher order pattern of either the forest or the forest times topography that gives you at least a course framework for scaling up yeah Sure, what that was. <laughs> I, yeah, I thought somebody else was piping in with a question, yeah. so I didn't want to talk right. over them. Uh, Gordon, does that answer your question? Yeah, as, as well as it can be answered at this point. Right. I, you know, actually, I think I like your idea of uh, sort of the, the larger scale patterns used for uh, upscaling. Yeah. I, and I actually should have, uh, now that I'm thinking about this a little bit more, there's a third approach, which is to start at the large scale and, you know, sort of take a, a top-down approach to the problem and just use the small-scale measurements to sort of evaluate subgrid parameterizations of the, of the larger-scale system. And that's something we have a lot of experience in doing, and, you know, with, with any sort of satellite campaign that's being developed that's commonly done. But um, it's, it's, I think... I think we're only going to get there by having groups going from sort of bottom up and top down and converging to, toward the optimal solution. <laughs> this is this is probably an unfair question since you didn't get to talk about the stream flow part. But uh, have you thought about using stable isotopes for helping you understand the the interaction between the snow and the and the water that's there from rainfall? Um, yeah, so th that would have been great if I could have gotten to the third section because that's, that's right. sort of the uh, the bread and butter of that. It's um, I was ill prepared, but um, you know the uh, we have looked at and I'll paraphrase the third section, which which shows that there's pretty strong differences at these CZO sites between the timing of snow melt and the timing of stream flow, and at our Colorado site. We're basically seeing that um, stream flow centroids vary by only about nine days, even though snow melt centroids can vary by a month and a half. Um, whereas at the Sierra Nevada site, the stream flow and snow melt centroids are pretty much, uh, you know, spot on with each other. And one thing we've done at the Colorado site to sort of explore the dynamics of that is to use isotopes to figure out. Um, 